My friendship with uh, Alak Rebe dates back to uh, under US communism in 1991. At that time, um, Dali was not there. So of course, Nancy was throwing with an idea of doing that. And I did the live demonstration for a course in Goa. And uh, Alak Rebe uh, showed tremendous uh, affinity people of India and to India itself. Every now and then when a group comes into India, we can visit Pondicherry, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a tremendous vast French colony in there. And um, our friendship was so good that uh, his son, who was a cinematographer, and I took him to, at that point of time, to B.R. Chopra, because he wanted to experience in India as the second largest in the world, movie maker. So I took him there and uh, spent time and uh, Alak Rebe has a uh, tremendous uh, zeal and enthusiasm and every now and then when he showed to, uh, uh, to the surgeons his idea of the body which was thrown away like as usual, that how it's going to stick there without surgical stitches. And uh, when he experimented to many of the first case when he did, uh, which uh, was uh, really surprised. Are you aware that Ali did his first case? Transeptal in a handicap fashion, and that you can imagine how difficult it could have been. But uh, and it has to be put in a reverse way. And uh, he did that, and the patient, of course, did not live very long. He died of infarction through a disability. So he rightly deserved a tribute because he has established that uh, there are still the the new alternate uh, treatment for disease of sclerotic gout. As the life expectancy improves, we will have to be dealing with this problem in more frequently than as we are doing now. And as a, over a long time, the cost will come down also. So we will be able to offer them to those who are suffering this. Thank you very much. And Madam Secretary, you see, uh, when uh, the, the state government has asked for my bar data, and uh, I forwarded, and then uh, I had, uh, they said, do we want to nominate you for Padma Award? Uh, there were going to be things, and then I uh, lost the track. And then uh, on 25th uh, January, I was not following around. Suddenly, I was in the car, and at 11 o'clock, I got a phone call. And he said, he asked my full name, Ashwin Bharatan Mehta. Now, that seems to me, nobody calls like that. So I said it could be either from my unfortunate <laughs> husband. <laughs> <laughs> I said, how people would ask like that is just uh, somewhat scary. So he said he's got he's from the Ministry of Reward. He said the uh, Department of Rewards uh, from the Ministry, Home Ministry, and he gave me the office. And uh, I think that uh, uh, you. It is just a, uh, one continues to do sincerely the work in which he has obtained and continue to job with sincerity, honesty, and with hard work. And uh, the society eventually recognizes it. And uh, I do realize that uh, I do happen to be a little fortunate one that a number of people are maybe now or even in time to come is more deserving. But it seems to me that uh, there are limited number of awards, etc. But in my eyes, all of you are award winners. And this award which I got is, I think, is a culmination of the goodwill, the love, affection, which has continues to encourage me to perform what I am doing. And 
this encouragement now enhanced by the government's recognition of this uh, by giving this honor. But now, uh, in order to keep uh, the image of the government, not allow it to tarnish such, I have to struggle even more so that I keep up to it. Thank you very much. Moving on, I think we all should sit and make ourselves comfortable first. But Professor Kani is also here. Come. So is everybody comfortable? Let's move on with the agenda for the day. We have all youngsters that is what we started about talking about youngsters doing the tricks. And we have first Mukesh Junior will go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Just joking. Dr. Rishabh. So Rishabh Parikh is going to speak on the alternate access to present day evidence. So having said that, I was also wondering. Well, you've heard about alternate accesses done by Sir you did one of the earliest ones in our WhatsApp university or whatever we want to call it in the WhatsApp group. You have seen that. But alternate access, I was also quite surprised, is that yes, as the TAVA procedure evolves further and further, even we're going to do higher and higher risk patients. So higher risk patients again are invariably associated with very bad humoral accesses going up the loop, up to the aorta is bad. So alternate accesses for whom humorals are a problem or IVFs are a problem, calcius, calcific. But that's not, and then the surgeons started helping. Apparently in the evolution of the alternate access, the transthoracic approaches, and we had the great Vinny Basak, and I remember my surgeon, Professor Dr. Ramakan Panda, went after a TCT course to this man. So surgeons thought they have still a hand to play in that. Of course they do have. So transthoracic approaches that we probably needed to say involved a lot of complications as well, both the direct aortic as well as the transepical. And very recently, as I heard, I thought that keratic interventions doing in neonates for neonate balloon aortic valvuloplasty because the carotid arteries are really bigger than the femorals, of course, and the accesses are simple and it's a straight shot in and you can balloon dilate neonatal aortic stenosis and stuff like that. But then, yes, with the existence of associated carotid disease might be there, it entails. And recently, and even he's going to speak on the carotid access, Dr. Ramakul Patel took on with Matadu. So therefore, alternate accesses are important. And I was quite shocked to know that about 10% of accesses, you know, 10% is the, it's the number two procedure today, transcarotid access in the French registries and so on and so forth. And I'm sure Rishabh, having come from Denmark, will tell us Everything to do with alternate access as an opening bastion. Go ahead, Tisha. Thank you, sir. So. so, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here and starting off uh, today's uh, series on alternate access with the first talk. I'm completely blessed to speak in front of uh, ABM, sir, PGK, sir, Kane, sir all the colleagues and especially uh, we're live on YouTube as well today and uh, it's just wonderful to be here in this lovely setup and uh, we can start with uh, the first access. So my talk for today is uh, going to be on uh, the evidence that we have uh, for alternate access in uh, TAVI. Uh, so to start off with uh, we have different vascular accesses for tower which are available for us. Of course, transfemoral being uh, the most commonest. And uh, we have multiple accesses which we can use. So let's uh, go through them in sort of a chronological order since uh, the beginning of Tavi and how it uh, went about. So the first in man Tavi was uh, done by uh, late Professor Alan Crevier, uh, and uh, that was an anti-grade approach. Uh, however, the anti-grade approach through which uh, he did the TAVI was quite traumatic to the mitral valve. 
So at that time, it was a 29 French sheet, and uh, that was the axis uh, size for balloon expanding valve, and hence a transapical approach was uh, developed, and that was quite well accepted within the surgical community as well. And uh, for that, uh, the transapical axis started off. However, we switched over to the other approaches soon for the self-expanding valves. And uh, transfemoral was one of the most obvious choices and it still is the most important as it is the commonest access site for TAVI. Uh, USD access guided uh, punctures now is the preferred method uh, with uh, the closure of the vessel uh, with either perclose or uh, any collagen based uh, closure devices. Uh, with the transfemoral access, what we are worried about is bleeding and life threatening bleeding is still one of the commonest complications of a transfemoral access. We have enough evidence, however, including a few meta analyses to show us that uh, USD guided access is associated with fewer. Uh, local site bleeding as opposed to a fluoroscopic uh, guided access. Uh, vascular complications still remain a major concern in terms of mortality and morbidity for tower. And with the rising rates of obesity, uh, it will always uh, be increasingly challenging. And hence, uh, we should all use ultrasound guided accesses. So why do we need additional accesses when we have the transfemoral? Like we face problems like either a small native size vessel, maybe a highly tortuous vessel, or we have uh, peripheral arterial disease where there are stents which are occluded, and we have multiple problems. And this accounts to almost more than 10 to 15 percent of uh, the patient population. And hence, uh, we need alternative routes than the transfemoral. So the transapical axis, which is the only anti-grade TAVI axis, was then the, the transapical pathway was the first alternative pathway which was described when the transfemoral was not possible. So this is the alternative pathway also with the most abundant data that we have. And because it was just transfemoral and transapical, we have a lot of data which compares the transfemoral with the transapical route and also with uh, surgical aortic valve replacement uh, for both. So uh, the TA axis uh, was shown uh, to be not advantageous to a surgical standard, uh, to a surgical uh, valve. Uh, it had a higher rate of stroke and possibly also a higher mortality. Uh, even in uh, the partner two trial which uh, randomized uh, intermediate uh, risk patients, uh, the outcome of the transthoracic approach was found to be non-inferior to that of uh, Sauber. And uh, if you compare it directly with the transfemoral axis, it was found to be inferior to the transfemoral axis. Uh, most of these studies included patients uh, treated with either uh, the sapien or the core valve initially. And at that time, we didn't have uh, newer data uh, with the newer generation uh, devices. Uh, so there was a registry, uh, there was a registry uh, which was international registry was reported with uh, a transapical special valve, the accurate TA, THV valve, in which about 500 high risk uh, patients uh, were taken up and they had two registries, the SAVI 1 and the SAVI 2 registry. And if we look at uh, the combined total of uh, both these registries, we find that it still had a high mortality rate. So the mortality rate was 7% total uh, at 30 days and about 20% in at the end of one year with uh, the transapical access, even with the newer generation valves. So then we move on to finding newer approaches and then we came across uh, the transaxillary or also known as the trans uh, subclavian axis. Uh, this was one of the approaches which was uh, initially traditionally uh, considered as a, a mandatory surgical approach but uh, over time uh, that has changed. Uh, we'll come across uh, to it. 
Uh, this was uh, initially one of the first papers which was published about uh, a trans-subclavian axis uh, from an Italian core valve registry. And it was comparing uh, the trans-femoral axis with uh, the, the trans-subclavian axis. Over here, uh, we see that uh, there was uh, no significant uh, difference between uh, the MACE uh, rates in uh, both the groups. And uh, if we go ahead and we, there was, if we look at uh, the mortality between uh, the two groups, uh, at 30 days and at 6 months, we can see there's a significant uh, difference. So the 30-day mortality was 0% versus 6% in uh, the subclavian uh, and the femoral group. And the 6-month mortality was 9 versus 15%. Uh, there were also no major difference uh, in uh, valve-related events. Like if we look at uh, the valve-related events, it was pretty much uh, the same in both the groups, even at the end of one year. Yes, this is comparing with what transfemoral approach? Transfemoral and transsubclavian. And what did it show? Uh, it showed, it's not statistically significant. Right. No, so it showed us that uh, so the mortality was uh, quite uh, similar, similar. Right. and uh, there was no difference between both the groups. And even if we look at uh, valve-related events, this is the major adverse valve-related events. It's also pretty much the same. So there was no significant difference between <coughs> the, the subclavian and the femoral. Uh, uh, this is the result of a meta analysis, yes. So obviously there is a selection bias over here. Yes, ones sir. which are not ones which are not suitable for femoral have subclavian is being done on them, right? Right. So sir. they are risk wise different people. And right. yet it at this to point be of time uh, it would be considered unethical. Because uh, hey, where there is a possibility of doing femoral and yet you will randomize to subclavian group, might be considered unethical because 98% of the you said that, but 98% of the cases are being are done, done to transfemoral. Yes. So, wouldn't then any analysis be uh, comparing apples with oranges here? Because, see, no, always be there. because the subclavian group would be preferred only if you have a uh, femoral, you know, which is, uh, which is not suitable to do. Uh, but that's so, so head-on-head comparison wouldn't would, would be like a wrong thing. But that is a, usually true for any evaluation of any new device or alternate device. Because you have to record some Now here, as we, as Harik, the, the transfemoral has become a good sound So they can be keep on comparing with that only. So now it is unavoidable. So like said, to give you an example, suppose an FFR. When FFR's validity was to be done, they were so careful that they... FFR, when they wanted to do comparison of its validity, that the given obstruction is really ischemia producing and flow limiting or not, so they did combination of three things. Stress test, then um, radionuclide study, this is a nuclear perfusion, stress nuclear perfusion, and also dobutamine, um, and took it took out an average, and they found yes, it was uh, comparable. Mm -hmm. So to have, I don't think that the randomized trial uh, can be offered because it probably would amount to violation of uh, uh, ethics. It would be difficult to have such a thing, but what somewhere I read, some one of the registries somewhere where the stroke rates were higher with higher with this subclavian route because you are across the brackets, right? So that's what I mean. I came across some paper which talked about a higher stroke rate, <laughs> wasn't it? I don't know with this particular this thing. This is not, not showing. This, this is not. So this was the first. It was just a registry from Italy. 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 Where, no, but uh, there is a sorry. recent one somewhere where I yes. thought that the stroke rates were higher with subclavian. So these were probably highly selected patients. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Can you speak in the mic so that it's a recording going on as okay. well? So the, there is some people who have logged in and it will be recorded. Okay, go ahead.
Sotomengku Sotomengku uh, a more recent uh, uh, article. So this article was published in uh, Structural Heart in 2021 and it was from uh, Riggs Hospital in Copenhagen. And uh, this article, I just put this article up uh, mainly because uh, it uh, beautifully describes uh, how to get the subclavian access uh, percutaneously. As we discussed initially that it was always mandatory uh, surgical access, but uh, this article and this study was where uh, they started using it uh, sub, uh, percutaneous access. Uh, it did have some additional uh, complex operative steps uh, to avoid bleeding or complications uh, where uh, you had to insert a wire uh, through the ipsilateral brachial artery down into the descending uh, aorta which uh, works as a sort of like a safety net so that uh, with the pore close if the vessel shuts down then you can either balloon inflated or if you need to put in a covered stent or something and uh, if we go to uh, the data of the study uh, over here both groups had uh, similar uh, baseline characteristics to start off with uh, in the surgically assisted tower group um, there were uh, six patients with uh, major bleeding and as opposed uh, uh, to none in uh, the trans axillary group and uh, if you look at the re-hospitalization so there were six patients again which were re-hospitalized within 30 days with uh, the trans uh, uh, with the surgical trans subclavian group as compared to uh, the percutaneous uh, subclavian uh, access group and uh, there's just one patient who came back uh, from the percutaneous group and the mean hospitalization was also quite low with uh, the ones where a uh, percutaneous approach was taken. So this paper effectively showed us that we have an alternative percutaneous axis if needed be apart from uh, the trans femoral axis. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, when you do percutaneous, you do axillary. So, so trans subclavian and trans axillary are very often uh, used synonymously. So. So right now we're just taking trans axillary as because uh, uh, the article uh, does uh, explain that uh, the puncture is way lateral in actually into the axillary artery. Rather. And the brachial plexus injury is not any matter of concern in the percutaneous axillary axis so as well. Is that right? Yes, yeah. because, sir, because that is why I, I always, almost always thought that the axillary means you got to be very, very careful about the brachial plexus injury, etc. But you read these articles, there's of course selective meaning, in reporting you might be selective, but there is no reported problem with brachial, no brachial plexus injury reported. So this is in this ultrasound. Ultrasound. Ultrasound, 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 ultrasound can yes. show you the axillary artery. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so it is all under uh, she in this going to present a case which we did. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we're going to have a case which shows a percutaneous. All the axes is, I mean, at least there are three cases in the interest of time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So there was a trans subclavian and a trans femoral uh, meta-analysis as well, uh, where both groups were comparable and showed really no difference at uh, 30 days either it's mortality, stroke, uh, MI, PVL, rate of PPM, nothing, so bleeding either. The only difference was that uh, the procedure time was found to be uh, more because the operators are always more used to the transfemoral axis than the trans subclavian. It's also the position of the table. It's also the position of the table. It's, it's completely against our ergonomic uh, views of how we're doing uh, the transfemoral axis. Uh, coming to another axis is uh, the trans aortic, uh, also known as a direct aortic uh, axis. Uh, this was looked at uh, with quite some uh, enthusiasm initially as uh, we thought that this was a minimally uh, invasive surgical procedure. Uh, the advantages of uh, trans aortic over trans apical were quite big because there was a reduced risk of bleeding, uh, there was no risk of an apical aneurysm or uh, LV dysfunction. Uh, in the follow-up uh, cases, uh, that, was, that is why uh, the trans aortic uh, peaked uh, interest. Uh, however, uh, this enthusiasm was uh, quite short-lived. Uh, 
uh, if we look at uh, the all-cause mortality or uh, death or major stroke or even uh, a major stroke, it was significantly higher uh, in the direct aortic group as compared uh, to the, the iliofemoral group uh, at 30 days. Um, apart from these, uh, there were uh, major life threatening bleeds uh, as well as uh, acute kidney injury was also much higher for uh, some reason in uh, the direct aortic group. Why do you think they are higher risk patients, right? Again, it's the apples or oranges story. Right. right. So, because you have chosen a trans subclinical axis only because femoral wise they were high risk as it is, right? So, there was advanced, everything was advanced in them. So, we weren't comparing that. I mean, it was that, it was an apple or orange story again. That's right. Because, sir, uh, we wouldn't do a direct aortic access for someone who has good femoral access, right? So then, That's to compare okay. both... Accidentally happened once. Dr. Balbir Singh showed a case in which surgeon had prepared everything to do surgical replacement. And when they went onto the table, they found prohibitive calcium distribution onto the aortic ascending aorta. So, um, uh, how, what to do? And uh, so we uh, spotted an area, uh, a sizable area, sufficiently large enough to be able to manipulate the hardware of transcatheter or valve replacement as compared to surgery, which will have to take a regular big incision, which was beyond their scope. So, on table, in a patient who has a recall to me, where they would have had to close down the thorax and come out with no, nothing, uh, he did it. So, uh, that, that is actually... I think it was last year, and India Live issue. Yeah, yeah, I... I, I think, yeah. I was also there. Yeah. yeah. So, it's very honestly quite unfortunate that uh, we still don't do a routine CT for all patients that undergo a surgical aortic valve replacement as well. Because if that is standardized, that all patients undergoing a surgical aortic valve replacement gets a CT, we can avoid a lot of these problems. You know, and they are not blocked, but once in a while. Yes, sir. Of course, once in a while. Uh, so, coming to uh, trans carotid axis, uh, it was first uh, reported in 2010 Hello. by. Uh, in 2010 by Modine in uh, France. Uh, so uh, there's a story behind uh, the first trans carotid which happened. Uh, so the patient had a uh, highly tortuous abdominal aorta, bilateral subclavian was uh, stenotic so they didn't have an access out there as well, femoral was out. And uh, when they did a CT scan they found that uh, the carotids were quite clean and uh, they decided to do uh, the first trans carotid uh, uh, tabby. However, during the procedure, uh, there was a dissection, the patient had heavy paresis and you know, it, it went all down south. But they implanted the, uh, the valve, there was a prolonged stay, however, the patient recovered quite well and uh, without any neurological deficit, the patient was sent home. Also, they dissected the carotid and that was not the surgeon's fault, it was obviously the guide wire induced dissection in the carotid. They gave nice pictures of yes, it. And uh, I mean, since then we've come a long way. This was back in 2010. So I mean, it's become quite routine uh, to do a trans carotid. It is looked at as one of uh, the alternate accesses now. And of course, the left carotid is uh, the more preferred access because it is more uh, coaxial to uh, the ascending aorta. So on uh, comparing trans uh, carotid axis uh, with the other routes, that is uh, the transapical or uh, the transaortic, we see that uh, both groups out here had similar rates of 30-day all-cause mortality, stroke, uh, new pacemaker implantations or any major vascular events. Uh, it was uh, similar. Uh, there was no significant difference in uh, bleeding or uh, in the median stay duration was also fine. It was rather a bit shorter. It was six days versus uh, eight days. So that was significant as well. And uh, transcarotid vascular access for tower uh, 
uh, was established to be safe and it was feasible and hence uh, it was looked at with uh, quite some enthusiasm. So coming to uh, trans cable access, uh, now trans cable is the newest uh, described approach amongst all uh, the various approaches that we have. Uh, the question here is uh, what is a trans cable approach and how is the trans cable access achieved uh, for TAVI. Uh, so this is basically accomplished uh, by positioning an aortic snare in uh, the abdominal aorta and uh, we take an electrified guide wire, puncture the IVC, snare it into uh, the artery and uh, once we have uh, the aorta cable fistula, the, we take the sheet through there and we complete the procedure like how we would do a normal transfemoral uh, tari. And just while uh, coming out, we keep a wire across and then uh, we close it with uh, an occluder. And in case if an occluder fails, we can always uh, bail out the patient with uh, a covered stent if possible. So this is what uh, the trans cable approach was and uh, it was uh, quite an interesting approach. And uh, while reviewing literature, we can uh, see that... Uh, Just one question. Yes, sir. Covered stent. So my, so my, 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 so my. Yes, sir. So the, the venous uh, site will continue to have a large hole, 14 French hole. So the retroperitoneal pressure so is usually higher than uh, the IVC. So uh, that is how the whole uh, trans cable approach was uh, developed. That uh, So if the IVC pressure is like 10, the retroperitoneal pressure would be like 20. So then there is less bleeding of IVC into the retroperitoneum space. So you put a cover stent in the artery and that... So, but that is all, of course a bailout. Uh, venous oozes in the groin can be accumulate more than within the... Uh, yes sir, that is because the retroperitoneal pressure is much higher than that of the so IVC. So. Obviously you want to address the aortic. But then the whole purpose of going through cable was because they had bad yeah, iliacs or whatever. Correct. So then putting in a covered stent in that case? So that is a bailout. I mean, the first choice is you put in an Probably occluder. The access required is still smaller. Yes. For, for, a covered, for a covered, covered stand, we covered still stand need like a, we can need to do with like a 6, 7 French. But the TAVI, a 14 French access would be yeah, quite different. In any case, it's sufficiently large enough to put a snare. Yes. The snare is not going to go without a sheet. Right. So that much amount of progress is just a really large size to... Yeah. So yes, you, you, to you can stare it from up, up also? Like from the uh, so they... Uh, from up, sir, I'm not sure. I, 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 I don't think any of this tried. They, so we do a pre-operative CT analysis initially and then uh, it's usually at the level of L3 where they go across and snare it. So I think Abhishek uh, Rajpopati has had three or four cases now recently done. So in one of our cases, which we know we discussed with him, so that's the way he does it, and the way you described. It. So there are cable cases that are done. Yes, the pre-screening, the CT, and all that would matter a lot, right? You could have bowel loop within between the IVC and the aorta, or you can have a very leftward aorta, and you may not be. I mean, if the pre-screening will determine that it is possible at some place, that there is so much in proximity that we can exactly puncture there. But otherwise it's not that everybody is accessible to opening, not every patient can undergo a trans cable. Gopal Murgan has done. Yeah. Gopal Murgan has also yeah. done. And again the aorta to be free of the calcification there, meaning a site in the aorta where this would come in and all that, they do a lot of apparently there's a series of some ninety five plus cases. Yeah, yeah, sir, have seen them. Like, yeah, I've seen them. 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 Uh, so, moving on uh, to some literature about uh, the trans cable approach. Uh, 
So now, if you compare it, uh, if you compare uh, uh, the trans cable with uh, supra aortic, uh, with regards to uh, 30 day mortality, uh, there was uh, no difference with either mortality, bleeding, any major vascular complications, or uh, even stroke. Uh, however, uh, we don't have uh, longer follow ups. Uh, because uh, of complications like bleeding, where uh, we see that uh, the, there is a high mortality at one year. As we come forward, we have more uh, studies and uh, patients undergoing transcable, they have, uh, if you compare, a lower rate of stroke uh, and they have similar bleeding as compared to a transaxillary axis. But if you compare it with a transfemoral axis, uh, it is significantly higher and uh, that just complicates uh, the whole idea and uh, the trans cable tower looks like an attractive option uh, with some experienced uh, operator but uh, it does have its sets of problems if we it's technically more demanding yes so we are so used to femorals that so the only comfort is that yeah. we're working from the femoral, but then yeah. it's, it's got a lot of... After some, some cases, uh, you can probably do it very efficiently as compared to the initial. The experience is too less than compared to yes. uh, So, if we do PDA or PDA? PDA or PDA devices. Sir. So now, sir, uh, if we compare all... No, no, sorry. I said it's a 14 French shape, so you know what size you yes. want. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, if we compare uh, all uh, the accesses together, uh, here we can see that uh, the trans cable still is one of the least uh, preferred because of high mortality stroke as well as uh, life threatening bleeding. Uh, so, I mean, to say that in conclusion, the perfect alternative pathway should be performed percutaneously under local anesthesia, should have the least amount of complications, you know, it should be as similar to the transfemoral in terms of mortality, stroke, major bleeding, rates of PPM, PVL, but needless to say we don't have the most ideal alternate access right now because there is no other access which compares one on one as to the transfemoral access. Uh, Life threatening bleeding was more, more with trans cable. Just go back. The blue bar. So with femoral. So that's the femoral. So in femoral, the only problem that we face in terms of complication majorly is life threatening bleeding. Right. But the mortality is the lowest. Mortality is the lowest. Stroke and stroke rate is also one of the lowest. I mean, not as low as uh, trans aortic or uh, I mean direct. Life threatening bleeding is the first line. Yes, sir. So so life threatening point. bleeding. So the blue line, the blue bar is for transfemoral. The first yeah, bar first is for bar. transfemoral. So transfemoral and life trans threatening bleeding is highest in transfemoral. Yes, sir. So that is what uh, the first uh, slide which I showed about USG axis versus fluoroscopic guided axis showed that with USG axis is even that has come down. So that is mandatory to puncture the vessel now under vision. That is the most ideal. The most of so the maybe we are yeah again trans cable is again the thing has evolved so much yeah. that uh, absolutely so this was in 2018 to, sir so yeah exactly so it's so difficult to buy that transfemoral as the very very high yeah. life threatening bleeding with the modern me, correct me if I wrong if I'm wrong that whatever you must have reviewed more literature but now amongst the alternate accesses the most preferred one at least the French registries and all there is a lot of data and they actually have shown a graph there in the TVT registry also where trans carotid seems to be the most popular alternate access of course after having pre-screened and picked up the ideal case then the, as an alternate access more than 10% is the uh, incidence rate right yes, Yes. Just All the trials you have shown have shown no significant uh, differences, right? Whenever they compare trans apical with trans femoral or trans aggregator, but why is it still class 3? Non TF Tavi is still class 3 in the guidelines. Because of so, what? Sorry. Sir, a lot of data is there which is showing that they are reasonably safe approaches, 
But as per the guidelines, non-TF tag is still class 3 indication. So, not recommended. So, non-TF in cases in which you could do the Correct. That is in cases where... Yeah. And I mean, so you should not do it as a primary approach, sort of. A thing. So it has not replaced the transfemoral axis. That's why. So that is have, why. If you have an ideal transcarotid case and you have a femoral also, both can both are possible in a given patient. Then obviously you don't want to choose a transcarotid over a transfemoral. That's what those guidelines will say. Isn't it? Yeah. Thomas Murden. Yes, sir. Thomas Murden. Yes, sir. Um, he has done not many cases and uh, he's a surgeon also I mean his uh, skill wise he has uh, not to depend on anybody else just in case so uh, that's uh, the way it is are you going to say something more about transcarotid because I wanted to give you some piece of information we did transcarotid and uh, at that point of time our proctor was Dr. Bapak and uh, it so happened that he was in favor of making a horizontal decision. And I asked him a question. So he says, just in case he fails to use one carotid, then it's easy to access the other carotid. Whereas my thinking was that if one fails in one carotid, if you have then I think you should call off the day rather than and for whatever reason you have selected a carotid is a is a piece that the other alternatives are not uh, accessible to do the and not only that uh, then uh, it also happens that uh, the isthmus of thyroid which is uh, situated just in the supraperitoneal notch suprasternal notch also has to be crossed and interfered with. It's a structure that would require consideration. And the vertical axis like this gives you a larger section of the artery available to you for your manipulation because you will have to put uh, umbilical tape both proximally and distal in your standard case if you open. I don't know if anyone is, is doing percutaneous or not, then I don't know. But uh, if nobody is doing, then I know what it was done. And our surgeon, Dr. Arun Mera, also was there. And uh, then uh, so he recommended that let's proceed. It's all right. So then he did the vertical incision. And uh, if one wants to go closer to the lower end of the carotid artery, uh, so that the manipulation is easier. That's what I did it is. I just thought I'll share with you that these are details and this to come to know when you do a case. I think the data is of the older generation, multiple data is of the older generation okay. one. Sheets are in fact now better off. Now you have such new generation of sheets like Merrill has come with a 12 French Python now. So we did a case with 12 French Python with 23 dollars. So I think it's getting more and more better, but then again we are comparing two different things here. I think mean, the, the comparator would be a transfemoral versus a percute subclavian, right? Correct. In, in one is to one randomization, and that would give you data. But like Sir said, most of the carotid cases, because we did carotid cases and did, did review of literature, what our fear was of stroke was, it was actually not statistically significant. But again the numbers were not huge, so maybe these studies were not powered and many of them were randomized data. Yes, so let's move on. Thank you so much. You <laughs> 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 I've just got two more slides to go. I mean, uh, so based on uh, uh, the whole accesses, there was uh, this algorithm which was suggested by Mori himself. And uh, here we can see that even though we started off with uh, transapical, uh, initially now that is like the least uh, favored option and uh, besides uh, safety I mean the choice of an alternative access depends on anatomical feasibility uh, the pre-operative imaging that we have as well as uh, the surgical and uh, the operator expertise as to whatever is uh, available to the best of us and uh, just to conclude uh, 
uh, what I think is that uh, we need to select the best access taking into consideration, as I mentioned, the, the favorable anatomy, the surgical expertise and uh, the operator skill. Also, every center uh, should focus on one additional alternate access apart from the transfemoral uh, so that we can optimize uh, the results for all our patients. And with uh, newer tools like uh, lithotripsy and peripheral orbital, you know, I mean, hopefully in the future there will be a lesser need for an alternate access to the femoral artery. And whatever is there, I think we should just perform the procedure the best and the safest way that is possible for our patient. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you conclude with what Steve Jobs said? Each one of us, <laughs> each one of us is interested. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I really like uh, this quote of his. It's, it goes like uh, great things. Uh, so it actually goes by great things in business, but I mean I just remove that part out. <laughs> great things are never done by one person, they're done by a team of people. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. But we have, I think, has anybody got any questions? You've got a big silent audience at the back there. <laughs> Vega, if you want to ask something, something. So this is for you. Or so you basically, want to add something. Like so basically in your center where you got trained, so what was the uh, like uh, the algorithm, so one would be transfemoral. If transfemoral is not accessible, I'm assuming it will be balloon dilatation or IVL and transfemoral. But after that? So it was uh, transfemoral, then orbital and transfemoral. If that is not possible, then they used to go uh, subclavian or transaxillary. And that was under uh, surgical uh, cut down, so that was not uh, uh, percutaneously at the thing. So Actually, the we were recently we met Dr. Kim and when I was there, they did everything transapical. Transapical. Trans yeah. Because their surgeon was so familiar with it because they were an yeah. enrollment center for the SAVI trials. And they would do it really well. Like. So they were transapical and transferable. And he had a point to make that the surgeons who were in the partner trial yeah. were not trained to do it. Correct. They were not trained to do the Dr. Kim had come here. So he was saying that, you know, his surgeon does Transapical, it does it very well. And the access closure and everything. Uh, but then the trials which the data came from, they were not that much. The surgeons, the were, surgeons, not the surgeons were not used to doing transapical. The US surgeons. Since we are in a structural heart meeting, transapical as an access, I think we all need to perfect it. We need to perfect it. Is my first experience of transapical was in Dr. Munsi, sir, our times. Used to for taking a gradient across the aortic valve, he used to do a transcendental <laughs> puncture. And literally, the needle used to do this, this, and he made me do one, one also. So, that's my only experience. Having said that, transepical access for paravalvular mitral leaks, leaks, especially the medial ones, it's a great access, and there are people like Carlos Rui and all. They swear by it and there is a paper, entire paper where the preferred route to do a medial one, a faster way, is transepical access. So we should not just discard transepical access for all the high modality or whatever he showed in the trans aortic valve replacement patients. Yeah. So with that, let us now, sir, you have to add something. Please no, go ahead. Just uh, Sushil used to do it just now also. And, um, the point which I realize is that you not exactly do it the apex because there's a thickness is too much. Yes, exactly. So you have to go a little bit more medium. Little medium. And then do it. Then it's easier. And then um, <laughs> we get Tari with a 12 or 14, now you see 12 with a 14 French sheet. Is and it a with the needle, there's a vast difference. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all puncture hard to do. We <laughs> to do it for adrenaline. No, I mean, uh, yes, sir. time and again, uh, accidentally. So my well, so last question, Rusha. If your transfemoral is bad and you have all the accesses which you mentioned, not transapical because we don't do it. You have the carotid, you have the subclavian of the axillary. Which would be your preferred after doing all the reviewing all the data? What, what, what is your conclusion? I mean if not the transfemoral, I would personally pursue the trans actually because that is only one which we can pursue with the percutaneous access. So I mean why not? But then again the strokes were higher when you did that. You showed the data, right? Uh, yeah. Even otherwise stop. There was something. no difference. There was no difference between statistically uh, statistically there was no difference. So. I'll add one more thing, huh? Yes. Sir. My experience. So the case that we did had a patent internal memory graft. 
to let somebody in. Now, the man was totally, totally dependent on the crowds because he's a Lima Lima boy. So now this is the first time probably in my opinion, till, I don't know now, but at that point of time, that was the only case that I knew about in the world literature. People have done with internal memory craft all right, but Lima Lima Y is a total circulation of the entire heart. And then what happened was that when we advanced the sheath, at that time, he developed ventricular tachycardia. So we withdrew the sheath and it settled down. <clears throat> and then it uh, occurred to my mind that if you are fast, in any case, ventricular tachycardia is developed while developing by depositing on the man-made ventricular tachycardia is always done. So I said, we'll use it instead of using the pacemaker. Given the experience now, thank you, thank you. if you have a total Lima Rima Y, would you advocate that? You did it, but would you advocate it? That's no, no, no. Um, the advocate means uh, people have mentioned that as a contraindication. In the literature, this is mentioned as a contraindication. <clears throat> but um, in a compelling situation, one does that. And then, not only that, Ignorant man is very bold, usually. <laughs> you already know that uh, we will be encountering interference with the flow of Lima. And we didn't know that then. So, so, I mean, uh, so probably due just the size of the circular artery. Yes, the, yes, we did. Bigger, yes, big. it was done open, by the way. Okay. Surgeon was there. So, shape moving, it was, it, yeah. So, it was a not in shift. It was uh, that time. I don't think in shift was there. So sizable portion of the shift would remain outside. We so withdraw it. So you see. And another thing is that you were saying about clumsy table arrangement. Yes. Then I saw one video where there are two teams. One team who stands near the axilla, left axilla, and which uh, supports the arduous. And the, the guy who is doing from below, he does the deployment of the valve in its usual way. For him, it is not trans auxiliary. For him, it is. Yeah, it's a, he is mocked it that way. Okay, so now moving on from the theoretical aspects of it all, we have three back to back cases. So, so this will be quick. Yeah, it's, first it's one is a subclavian root. In a geriatric female, all of them I thought were geriatric, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. So, towers are geriatric, right? <laughs> <laughs> geriatric to so, so, Hopefully, nowadays that's what we aspire for, sir. What? <laughs> geriatric so, towers. Um, nowadays, it's, it's happening everywhere. So, uh, geriatric towers. <laughs> once, uh, once we are tuned to biology so much, that in a geriatric, you would not use the word lady here, but uses the female, which I think uh, is uh, less sophisticated. <laughs> yes. yes. So, uh, 81 year old, very fair. She was very fair, female. <laughs> lady. Recurrent heart failure. She's had three admissions for heart failure in the past. Again, presented with dyspnea angina and NYHIC class 2. Significant LVH with calcified aortic stenosis with a gradient of 137 by 96 and an aortic valve area of 0.4 severe pulmonary hypertension. So uh, now the issue was um, infrarenal abdominal aortic stenosis, severely narrowed and calcified femoral vessels. So we planned a subclavian root tap. Now this was before, it's a, it was a t some time back, before ideal access was there, before, uh, it's about four years back, before uh, I think we had that kind of approach where we could drill the calcium or crack the calcium or that sort of thing. Um, so what we initially did was from the femoral axis, we went in and we put in a wire across, took a DSA shoot. May I interrupt? Yes, sir. Before you go to the procedure itself, yes, sir. did you evaluate the subclavian? Yes, sir. The yes, sir. Tell us that. Now, so, what is the 
pre-screening for supply so, or take or for that matter alternate access. So this imaging wise CT what is different in pre-screening? CT autogram but this was done with all vessels. So, so, the neck vessels. Uh, so, so so normal tally CT should include carotid and Now by protocol should include supply or also. They start from the carotids, they include the subcutaneous and go all the way to So like for instance the first trans carotid that he talked about yes. had bilateral osteal subclavian narrowing. Yes. Okay. So that is a clean subclavian on this basis. And even if you are planning nothing. to deploy a sentinel you would treat that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it is now and now this is so much. So it's, it's part of the CT protocol. So we had assessed the carotids, we had assessed the subclavian, the femorals were anyway out of uh, an apical line. It seems the femoral were not an option. Obviously option. we expect disease Some elsewhere. elsewhere. So that there was no disease elsewhere is a lucky thing. Right. Yeah. So, so thankfully uh, we didn't have much calcium here. So a DSA guided puncture was taken on the road map. Then the subclavian was passed. Um, what was done was dilatation of the subclavian artery and uh, securing the access with a percutaneous uh, closure device. Okay, I'll switch that up. Okay. When was this done? So this was done four years back. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, crossing of the aortic valve. 2020. Just before. Just, just before. Again, again, uh, amplax catheter in the LV, Nandakwish superstitch wire. Can you go back and explain that more? So what, what did you do there? Because this would be routine Tavi, right? Yes. Go behind and just explain. Now. Where is your wire there? Which is, why did you dilate the subclavian? So dilated with the sheets. Okay, oh, sheets. Sheet. 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 So, so the thing is, um, there are questions where people say why was a left radial not taken uh, to get guide wire access. So, so basically you are crossing the subclavian because if the access does not close, if your throw glides, then, so you have to have a safety wire. safety wire. So safety wire here was put from the femoral across. You could do the same thing to the radial because then you can take the balloon there and occlude with the balloon. When you when you close, the final, the final thing is the bleeding. Bleeding when you take the device out. The rest while going inside there won't be any problem. So the safety wire in this case was put from the femur. You could do that. Yes. So you are from down you see sir. So it was it was she had infrarenal aortic stenosis. Not not big enough for a 14 French. But so so this is yes. Now, now, the thing is, this was that four years back, we didn't have data, we didn't have experience also for that matter. Uh, and very frail, I means she was frail enough not to take a surgical cut down also. We were more worried about what would happen. We had a surgeon on standby. So you had one funeral access there? Right? So we had enough for a six friends. Okay, so you put that into... Yes, sir. That yes. guided your puncture. Then Why is that funeral? catheter into the left subclavian for so, what reason? So one is to have a safety backup, you should have always have a safety wire in case it closes down. And once you withdraw all your hardware, to achieve hemostasis you have to have balloon inflation there. So those were the two main reasons. So we had a percute, uh, perclose which was done. Uh, and then a routine. How does the perclose work in subclavian? See, in femoral it's different, now you go like this. It's the same thing. Same thing. Same, 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 same way. Same, same, same way. Same way. Nothing no. Different. No. Same way like you dissect the skin and you dissect the skin yes, and yes, the little yes, 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 dissect and make a plane to reach up to the... Right. Can you touch the subclavian? No. 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 It was a percute, sir. Per it, it was not cut down. It was not a percutaneous. Just like how we do it in femoral. Wait, was that the right? Under, so this was under DSA guidance. Okay. We had a wire across. So. So extra axillary, I mean, you have to go the outside, yeah. And then uh, the main thing is the subclavian, uh, the, the clavicle and the rib there, that junction which is there, there, you might face some problems while you are taking the sheet in. 
Your yeah, order grants actually they say that you should just go medial to the caput of the humerus. That is where you will get ideal ideal trans axillary access. And what are the chances of puncturing the lung? The very blue of puncture it's only solo guided. Yes, system. it's solo guided. Solo guided. Solo guided also. How did you get rid of blood? Getting hitting the lung. Is there any way? So how? So when? So what do you see on the solo guidance in other words? Yeah. Because we are used to hitting subclavian veins and we are quite confidently we hit subclavian veins. Right? So now for an artery, how different is the puncture? You of course doing it and the artery It's always extra thoracic. So you it's always extra thoracic. It's always for an extra thoracic. Like you do for an extra thoracic. For a pacemaker. For a pacemaker similarly. We just do extra thoracic. Just like a pacemaker. Yeah. But excellently <laughs> understanding is extra thoracic. So, for nomenclature wise, it was subclavian or axillary. So, we went laterally. So, it's more a puncture is necessarily the axillary, right? The axillary yes. part, yes. Yes. not yes. the subclavian. Yes. No. So, it's quite lateral. It's, quite it's, it's, almost, near the it's almost like an axillary. Yes, yes. almost like an axillary. Yes. 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 Also okay, okay. No, no, no. Then it's fine. Yeah. And can you tell me where is the puncture? Yeah. The sign of the puncture? So if you can see, yeah. Okay. The proglades don't close, then there is a problem. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. so on this fast you cannot. The, part. the main thing is femoral. You can have somebody compressing. Compressing. I mean, actually, there is so, nobody there compressing. So now you are just like there exactly. down below. So that's the whole difference. So you have a surgeon as a backup. Always, 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 always. always. So surgeon patient safety is first. For all trans, what you call the alternative accesses, one must not forget that the surgeon is all important. So, so anyway, so, um, so now as you can see, we are crossing from the subclavian from the femoral axis. Just one question. Yeah. Whenever you are deploying the purpose, could you pull back the safety wire? So likely to get trapped inside the... No sir, but when you are deploying the purpose... Excuse me. Use the mic. Use the mic. So the safety wire is put after you deploy it. Okay. You never want to get caught. So actually he's shown the image later. Just show that image. Pitch it. Pitch it. Go back. Go back. Go back. See the problem, there's no safety wire. Correct. So after the... So, 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 So it's, it's after like closure. After, after, after closure. After the pop closure. Yeah, we had a dissection yeah. on the subclavian, but we had a safety wire, so yeah. we put a covered stain. So, it's playing here, it's not showing on top something. No, this thing. So the loose, loose contact to here. Area. I, I, I so compared to femoral, the proglide itself can cause dissection. 
the bite. I was thinking how else could he have broke. Yeah. Otherwise, I was wondering whether balloon camp or other key. Yeah, broke like generally. See, oh yeah, yeah. And actually, we could have left the dissection, but since it's we have a covered stand, supplement dissection, and our first supplement case, so we don't want to take a risk. We put a covered. You'll see it there. After the balloon, the flow is very nice without this. Case. So you use the feeder wire to cross. Then the micro catheter was taken to see that we are in in the two lumen, and the shoot was taken. That's a good case. Well, this is now Mr. Arish Mehta has also joined us here. So this one he did with a puncture. But today, what's the way about going about so subclavian axillary approach? You got to necessarily what is better yeah, to do it with a surgeon doing it. Yeah. Everything you must have yeah. there. So initially, when we start this case, there was generally people used to do surgery. But we read a little about this that there were cases done with punctures. So that's why we did a puncture. But now the norm in United States is puncture. They don't do puncture. The subclavian is puncture. They puncture. do actually like they do puncture. Auxiliary puncture. There are some who still do surgery. But predominantly tiver through subclavian is now puncture. Okay. Great. That's a great question. Anybody else, sir, who has access? Sir, at Tanu, the one with the EMA, I remember. Yeah, in the post. Sir, whether it was here, I don't know. You have put a femoral sectional catheter. Yes, sir. So you chose a Cleveland route for experience or? No, the 14th French was not going, sir. No, no, no. She had 2.53 millimeter vessel, it was totally calcified. Totally calcified. Badly calcified. She was rejected in that time in Dubai. She was seen in Dubai that there the tabby experience was not there, so she was rejected. You either go for direct aortic access or you go for alternate access. That's when she came to us. And when we analyzed the CDs, we realized that carotid was good enough. I mean, subclavian was good enough. And this was good enough for taking smaller ones. Okay, thank you, Srinivas. And let's have now. Transcarotid access. Just fresh one. Last month. Last month. She had a previous history of stroke. Uh, she was a chronic kidney disease patient. Also, uh, she had uh, 
she had a lot of allergies and also blood transfusion. Every time she received a blood transfusion, she used to uh, get go into AKI. So that was she used to have severe transfusion reactions. So next slide. So she was diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis. Issue with this and directly coming to the to the issue in this patient was the access. Next slide. So this was her CT analysis. That, that is going live, that screen, so that is the issue. So I think we should, uh, if you want, we can cut down the screen directly with later. Yeah, that might be okay. Yeah. That might be a better okay. Yeah. Done with the screen. Yeah. 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 So these are the annular dimensions. It was a small annulus. Uh, you could see the uh, the area derived and the perimeter derived was around 19. And the perimeter was around six, uh, 61. It was a small, uh, a small annulus. Uh, there was nothing specific in the NBOT. Next. So coronary heights are fair, and uh, it was a, it, it was not a horizontal. It was a regular uh, aortic lie was okay. Next. So uh, the patient had a stent which was there on the right side. So the patient had a bad peripheral vascular disease, and you could see there was a graft on the on the left side and a stent on the right side, and uh, there was severe calcification. You could see that uh, the whole issue was that even if you access this side, the problem was she had bad peripheral disease as well, and uh, she had recently recovered from a non-healing ulcer which was there in the lower limb. So whole the whole thing was even if you find an access there, if, if uh, during closure there's a thrombus which happens and so it goes down, it would cause even more you know, complications. The other thing was uh, she had a pacemaker on the on the uh, on the left side, and if you can see uh, the dimensions were around 5.3. It was quite narrow on the uh, on the left the left subclavian, and the right uh, was a uh, reto aortic uh, had a reto aortic course, so it had an anomalous right side. So all the accesses had issues, so, and there was a pacemaker also there with the stenosis. So the only access we thought was could we could access is to uh, we, we could go through is the carotid. Uh, and you can see in the carotid also on the on the right side uh, there was some plaque which we could see lower down. The left side was quite clean, and the dimensions were fair, and there was no calcification on the right. If you see in all the arteries except for this carotid uh, rest everywhere, there was severe calcification which was there. So uh, this was the the plan because it was a small annulus. We thought we'd put an accurate neo uh, and S uh, pre dilatation with an 18 mm and post dilatation if required. That was the plan. Now the problem with the transcarotid is uh, it, the the lies such that it goes straight down, and we can see that that, that it does not sit on the non-coronary cusp. And for an accurate neo, if you have to use this, you have to have uh, it moving from one side to the other. So you require it, the wire lie to be there on the non-coronary cusp. So, but the uh, but, but the plan was to uh, and, and the second thing was if you don't have that, then there's not adequate support. So it, it, there is a chance of embolization. So. Uh, otherwise, a regular uh, plan, uh, transcarotid, three cusp orientation, guide wire deep in the ventricle and the uh, curve facing up, uh, pit tail at the deepest point of the NCC. Uh, facing, we, we thought we'd use the pacemaker to pace, and uh, that's how we how we went. This wall does not require a lot of pacing as well, but the, in, in this case, because there was a chance that, you know, because the lie was such that it might embolize, we thought we'd pace. Uh, and uh, the last moment is always forward in this wall. Next. This is the this is the accurate view to how how it is designed. Uh, five to seven is the zone in which you have to deploy the wall. So quite deep. Next. So uh, we know about this. This is the accurate view to how you do the commercial alignment and uh, 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 just just showing the description the three cusp view. You should see the uh, the arches above, and it just it has to be one one one. If it's not one is to one, then if it's one is to two, that means it's one out here and two out there. Then you do a counterclockwise moment, and always you start at the six o'clock. But there are centers which 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 do a lot of accurate new do. They start with three o'clock as well. So depending on that, and then you go and confirm the cusp overlap view. You see the free cell. You can see the free cell there in the blue mark. 
So if it's if it's towards the inner curve, that means you are all right, you are aligned with the commissure. But it's if it's at the outer curve, that means you are completely malaligned, and then you would rotate, you would make the exact opposite movement in that case. Now, when you do a carotid case, the main issue is how do you keep the uh, uh, the C arm? So you, the problem starts from here. So whether to keep the C arm like this or like this. So but this in a subclave, when you would prefer a head side because you want everything here. Uh, this would be the preferred way in which you keep the C arm. And three operators, <coughs> one holding the sheath because I have shown in the video that it's very important because the sheath lies out. It's not there inside, unlike the femoral. So somebody has to hold the sheath. The first operator comes here. He actually becomes the second operator. And there is the third operator who is there on the table. Next. Are you aware from the C arm side? Yeah. No. You showed it on the C arm side. Huh? But you would stand like this. No, towards the CM side. Ah, towards the CM side. But the CM would be like this. The CM would be headward. The CM has to be like this. And your table will be like this. So, I've done a similar one, but we did it on this side. All three on the other side. All three on the other side. You went to the left carotid or the left carotid? Left is a Left is a good direction. Which is quite. 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 And for you also, your your entire movements are better off when you are doing from the left. So it is. So this is how we uh, took the axis. So the plan was to uh, to expose the carotid artery, and you can see the surgeons doing that. Uh, and uh, as sir told, to to take two basic loops or the loops which are there across. So wherever your side Just is. Just one incision. You can take one more or one. No, it's supposed to. It's a sheet. Supposed to stabilize the sheath. This is the no. so so what? Just tell the technique you did. So, so what, what? What? You can see two loops here. So they take two loops here to the first proximal and distal for stabilization, and then you mark the the, the carotid puncture site. And it's very easy to you can see it guided. You can see the carotid and just you can puncture. But before that, a pursing suture is taken around. So some surgeons don't like that. They don't open the carotid. They don't they open the carotid. They put a pursing around the uh, anterior wall, and you puncture in the middle of the pursing. So the regular is, no, tell me one thing. Uh -huh. Your surgeon, which is the cardiovascular surgeon, mm -hmm. sir should be able to tell, guide us about this. Sir, how often have your patients of cabbage or any other procedure, for just for carotid endarterectomy, how often have your surgeons of yesteryears or whenever, or current years, sir, do they do carotid endarterectomies? Carotid, carotid, yes, very often. Very often right? and, um, our surgeon for that respect is Dr. Suresh Joshi. Yeah. And he does very often. Very often. Yes. So now I am just a thought, okay? With this one you did with a puncture. So would you prefer to have a surgeon who's got experience of carotid endarterectomy? Yes. Always better. Yeah. Someone who's doing carotid is better than someone who's never done a carotid. Exactly. Or who's going to do it the first time. So because always, always. by and large our patients of cabbage are younger patients. Relatively, compared to the group that comes to the tower area. Ca towers are generally septuagenarians and octogenarians. We definitely so need a surgeon who can, create, uh, can come out of the problem yeah. if he creates some. Exactly. Yeah. So, because they also recommend that you <coughs> end up with a carotid endarterectomy if you want to, so to say, and a surgeon should do it. Like a 50% disease in the carotid is not a contract. Most importantly, the opposite carotid should be good. So within this carotid, you might even, based on your incision and whatever you've done, you might even end up with a carotid endarterectomy at the end of the carotid. So there's no incision. There's no incision. You're doing with a puncture. Yeah. But I'm talking about surgical, the, of course, the way you do it. But the way you are just say, telling us a different way of having done it. Absolutely. Because the carotid is exposed, you puncture and you do it. So that gives you stability for the sheath yes. also. But otherwise, when the surgeon completely does it, He's supposed to take one more incision behind. You will see that picture that uh, Rishab showed. So that the sheath goes through the, uh, comes out to the other incision. And he gets stability of the sheath. Huh? When a surgeon has done it. does two ways. One is that he puts a graft. The two ways. One is here. You see the supply of the surgeon doing it. And then you put a graft. With a graft, you graft, you push your sheath through the graft. They put a temporary graft. So you do everything through the graft. So the, that also gives you support. The picture that I showed, 
right? Uh, they did a complete uh, cut down. They opened and they opened it. And what they did was uh, they took a puncture with the needle, but they initially took the needle through the skin and then onto the artery. So what that does is it stabilizes the sheet. See, so you don't need so a holding suture. That's, that's the that's only why difference. It by a separate incision above. So that the sheet so it's just a one incision through the skin only. It's it's just one incision, right? So and they create a skin like they they separate it from the artery. Yeah, so, so you puncture the skin and then under vision you puncture the artery. So what that does is it just stabilizes the sheet. But again, that's it's it. also still going puncture only. Yeah, still yeah, yeah. It's, it's still puncture. So it's still opening. It's, it's not, not opening the artery. Yeah, yeah. But it's not opening as in the little they call it. No, they're not screening. No, sir. No, they don't take a You're going. You have the. Nice as you said, you must screen. Just make a puncture. Just make a puncture and then puncture. Yes, sir. Yeah, center of that puncture. Center. Yeah, then you go there. Then then yeah, 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 ye
So this is what happens when you use the character. It comes so straight, like it comes straight down. So there's no NCC support which you get. So it comes straight down, and that's the problem with with using an accurate new. So I we would ideally want a balloon expandable wall here. Okay. Go there, a metal would be better in this case. You go down and just inflate. But here, because you require a support, it's a very soft wall. You always require it coming from the NCC here towards opening that side. But uh, is that some straight? Yes, yes, yes. You yes. have yes. yes. to be around the outer block. For this wall, yes. For this wall. That's why you have to You have to maintain. And therefore, the wire should always be the So, one good thing was we had the pacemaker, and this does not cause, it's like a balloon expandable, it doesn't cause a lot of pacemaker issues. But then, one thing was if you want to go down below, beneath, even if you go slightly down below, it's okay in this case because you have a pacemaker which is already there in this lead. So the push is the last moment in this wall. Next, next thing. So, so you can see here. So you can see here how the sheet. See this much is the sheet, and this is your device, which is going through. And you see it's one one one. So it goes straight down because you don't require any manipulation. It doesn't go like this. It's like straight down. You can see it's one 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 here. Nicely see. And then you go to the uh, the, uh, the overlap view and you see the free cell. Again, the free cell yeah, towards the inner curve. That means you're commercially aligned. So you didn't have to do any cloth. Nothing. Or nothing. Nothing. Just that go down. Move, move, move yeah. straight. Nice. Next. So after you're aligned and you're okay with the the wall position, this was slightly for some for people who do accurate new tools. This would be not an ideal position to 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 have. You want it at the cusp. You don't want it like. No, it was not. And to you do anything, it doesn't come. We did we tried. We tried pushing, it did not. I think we have done it. Sir, or maybe Safari. Maybe Safari is small or instead of XS. Safari is small. Safari is small. That would be right. But I think try, but it is always when you try pushing it, nothing happens. It goes straight. It might move a little here and there, but it never comes on the NCC. So again, the upper crown release. This is the regular how how you open an accurate new tool. Next, and then finally the stabilization arches and control check. You were okay with the depth. The depth was okay on that side. You can see the marker there at the level of the annulus. Next, and then finally opening of the valve. So what is the last forward so the push? So this, what were you talking about the last forward So this forward? wall, the last moment should always be push. So the last push, 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 push. The issue with this valve is that if you release the push, it will come back. When you open it, it's a it's such a jerky motion. The inertia will pull it up. And it's such a soft wall. motion has to be ahead. So the first operator cannot ever release his hand. And has to be on all the time. So the, it'll come out. So, so the, how you how you hold this wall is even if you the, all the commission alignment should happen up above the wall. Once you are done with, like in the mitra clip, you do all the movements in the LA and then finally go in the LB. You are also the uh, all the movements of commission alignment has has to be up. And when you try pushing down, it's like this. You hold it like this and push. <coughs> and the final moment should be push because if you pull, then again. Yes, the radio strength. What you are supposed to do, to the best of my understanding, but I have only one experience of this one, is that the second operator has to keep that lower border of that marker always at the end. Your job is to push it and keep it there. First order, more or less. It should be there. So second day, first. First order, first order. Yeah, second release is then first operator. Yes. So, I'm good. Like me, one more applicable quotation from Steve Jobs. You should live your life in such a way that the last check of your life must bounce. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm good. Thank you very much. Photograph. Thank you. Photo. 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 Photo.
floor mounted in Catlair, you're there, this will come in the way. The CM will come no, no, in the way. He's the talking about the Your ability ah, to see the monitors, the monitor ka frame is always seen in the Pacemaker. Pacemaker ka frame. Right, sir. Sir, the problem with that is your... Yeah, the lab mode is here, move on. The monitors move. And the other thing is... Both of them. Your ceiling height should be enough. So that the table has to go that much down and then the whole monitor has to go on the other side. If the ceiling height is low, it won't I look down. I look Getting risky is not there, not in the air. Here you are not in the air, they are always in the air. You are straight, you are always in the air. Reality is not in the air. You are not in the air. Okay, sir, let's move on to the... Sir, there is a request, please use the mic. Otherwise, they want... No, mic, tell me. So, let's reinvent the wheel. We said trans-epical is highly complicated. Shouldn't be doing it. At the end of it all, let's see the advantage yeah. of the plans that we can make up. So, good evening everyone. So, as we, as Rushab kind, uh, kind of discussed that Transepical is, you know, out of the books, but probably it isn't. It depends on the expertise of the surgeon. So, uh, we just uh, show a case in which we've done a Transepical at the time of state in the So, why alternate access, as Rusev shared, when transdermal is not possible? So why transepical? To be honest, when other arterial accesses are not possible, and if the surgeon is comfortable with it. So the first transepical case was done by E. et al. and they had described it in 2006. And what are the advantages? So it's the only anterograde approach, so it's very easy to cross a bath. It's it's damn easy. The surgeons can cross the bath. Uh, the peripheral vascular anatomy and the size is not a limitation. Even for porcelain iotas, you can do a transepical. It has a lesser stroke risk as compared to other arteries, especially if they are tortuous and calcific, and obviously less contact streams. So, what's the disadvantages? Uh, longer recovery time because uh, the transaortic and the transepical require <coughs> paracetamol increased risk of bleeding and it's not suitable for patients who have velvet dysfunction or you know significant lung disease and it's also not suitable who have you know very thin delvi or a very small cavity and there's a risk of uh, LV suga aneurysm and further impairment of LV dysfunction if you have So uh, just before I move on uh, just show of hands who have had exposure to transepical tavis. I said the way back. As a resident. So when cement disc was launched, they used to do that transepical. That's what I've seen. I've seen two cases. Cement disc, which is caught over by this, which has become accurate near two. Okay. It was launched transepical. Then they moved to tavis. But why not? Sorry. Can I interrupt you? You want to finish first? No, you can interrupt. The reason I'm asking you is why not do an ultrasound gradient puncture? So why do you want to open the ultrasound gradient puncture for a tablet? Ultrasound gradient puncture for the LV? Absolutely. It's done for device closures, PVL closures. Yeah. Do a transepical puncture. But the honor of what you can't do is ultrasound gradient. Yeah. I think for PVL, a CT tells you the entire anatomy. Yeah. It's a CT and a coronary. Again, whether the LED is going to come, how to avoid the yeah. LED also for yeah. when the oh, PVL closure. Closure. Yeah. Paramel, PVL closures. You must have done by without by. Sir, but this will be a fourteen French. So we have better come out. Tell me about the implant supply. Fourteen French. Implant supply, yeah. Yeah, implant supply. All end up with implant. Nowadays, PVLs which are done transepically are not opened anymore. They go. And the PVLs. So, would you puncture directly through the skin or you would make an incision and then... No, 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 directly. Directly. That is probably done by the surgeons and the cardiologists don't get it. So, it would be a hybrid lab. 
yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've seen done. him doing it, but I've we shown it, shown it live. So I've not been into the lab who all are standing. Okay. But then how would you know if you're puncturing where yeah, the LED is here? Yeah. It does echo. Yeah. It locates where the LED apex is going to be. Yeah. And under guidance, that's where he punctures. Yeah, but the described methodology is... With CT, of course. CT to karayi, sir. CT to karayi, sir. CT to karayi, sir. Thing is marked for you, and then you yeah. just need it online. Oh, okay. Then you puncture, and then you take it from there. Everything is key. But what the first time suit was uh, like the perfumes and all tape. No, there is no perfume was there. Then how would you close they put a sheet? The, you the, just put the ventricle holds the sheet. No, because it's muscle. Yeah, but once the sheet comes, they put a blood sheet even. Yeah, like but once the close of PDA. If it bleeds, then but what? No, no, no. no, no. they are oversized. Don't bleed. The elephant no. bleeds. The surgeon is there. No. The LV is not going to bleed. What else is there to bleed? The subcute and the skin. The subcute and the skin will bleed. Because once you close the plug, it will not bleed. Unless your plug dislodges and you are out with the sheet. So your perforus is on the artery. So when you do a transfemoral. Likewise. He was putting the plug. The plug is on the LV apex. Would it be a source of clots, thrombus and all? Yes, of course. Immediately. You can do an angioid. You can do an angioid. You can do an angioid. Over here we have a 14 French axis as opposed to like a 6 or 7 French axis while uh, doing a PVL closure. PVL closure. I'm talking about PVL. I'm not talking about transepical yes, travers. Okay. I do not know if people do transepical travers without incision. I have seen him put a 10 French sheet. So 10 mm, 14 mm closure. So why 14 mm closure? It should be able to. Sir, but uh, for uh, the sapiens devices. We have trial for that, yeah. Sir, but for the sapiens devices, the certitude sheets are 18 French minimum. They are not 14. I'm just saying to wife. Yeah, the certitude sheets are 18 French. And the certitudes are what the trans... For character trans... For trans character trans... For the surgical incident. The certitude... Maybe it's a thought. You can ask Shiva whether... What largest size device is he used? Mine. So, uh, if time permits, then I have some videos of uh, oh, the sure. certitude one, so how the surgeons open it up and all, so a courtesy Edwards. So, so as uh, Rushab had pointed out that, you know, the trans thoracic cohort of the partner to trial did not show superiority even compared to the surgical areas, but it was not powered to the subgroup analysis and also, you know, the surgeons were not trained in transepical, so you would not be sure. So, in our center, if the surgeons see that they can't cross clamp the iota and the trans, uh, transfemoral cavities are not possible, our preferred approach is the transepical. So, around 3 to 4 percent of cases of cavities are transepical. So, this is the hybrid theater in how the, where the surgeons and the cardiologists are. So, we as interventional cardiologists would be where we would normally do our femoral procedures. The surgeons would be over there because they would take the left uh, thoracotomy and all. And they would be the ones holding the sheet, but we would be the ones who would eventually deploy the valves. And we usually do it under TE guidance and there's an anesthetist as well. So, this is where we take the, uh, normally take the incision. So, before we take the incision in the hybrid lab, we usually put in a towel uh, behind the uh, left chest so that, you know, the chest is slightly tilted up. So, the apex rather than being lateral, it just shifts a bit medially. So, it becomes easier for the surgeons. And then, uh, we mark on, based on the TE where the apex is so that the surgeons take that incision there. It's usually the fifth or the sixth intercostal space and the incision size is around five to seven centimeters. So, uh, I will show these videos. So basically, they put in a rib spreader. So they open the spaces between the two, two ribs. They put some, uh, they retract the pericardium and they locate the puncture site. So, so where exactly the puncture site is, so if we see that the apex is usually the thinnest uh, portion in the LV. So, they puncture a bit lateral to it and they see that there is no LED or a big diagonal branch around it. So, they find a 2 by 2 centimeter of bare area and then uh, they kind of poke a finger and under T, they, once poking, they see if it's coaxial to the aortic annulus because the wire should go straight in and it should avoid the mitral apparatus. So, once that area is located, they place the first string sutures. <coughs> 
and after that it's a very standard procedure. They put in a suspension sheet and then after that uh, they, they put in a lundquist wire into the descending thoracic iota uh, by exchanging it with a GR. And this is the certitude sheet. So it's a smaller sheet uh, and as I said it's a bigger sheet. It's an 18 French and uh, these markers are spaced at 1 centimeter. So normally the surgeons put it at 4 centimeter marker. And this is the delivery system. So it's similar to Merrill, there's a flex catheter and otherwise everything is similar. So one, if you flex it, uh, you can, you know, the basic idea is if the, the valve has to be coaxial to the annulus while deployment. So this is the marker under fluoroscopy. So this is the Edwards thing and there is no uh, stage to it which you know, you pull the uh, the balloon back onto the valve, it's directly crimped onto it and there is no pusher on it. They started this with transferon also but they are it. Yeah. So it's very easy once you are in, you just it's, 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 it's Merrill, it's Merrill but there is no dog boning which happens, it happens, opens up similar to other Edwards. So they, they need not do it because yeah, there's no need for it. Yeah. So it's a 55 centimeter delivery sheet, and this is the valve loader. So once the sheet is in, and then uh, on this on, <coughs> then you put this loader, and through this loader the valve goes in. So this loader has a uh, button over here. So once the valve is in but not out through the sheet, you have to press on this button and uh, you have to de it. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. Like this risk of yeah. 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 is more. Oh. So we have a case, uh, so it's just a case, it's a 78 year old gentleman, severe AS, preserved LV, a lot of comorbidities. Uh, Coronaries were okay, uh, femorals were hostile and we tried the supplements were less than six, they were very tortuous and our center didn't do carotids at that time. So we planned a 26 <coughs> millimeter sapin under GA. So we put in a uh, pigtail through the left femoral. So this is all standard and you can see here, this is the sheet, this is where the sheet ends and this is the delivery catheter and that's the tip of the delivery catheter and that's the valve. So the sheet ends somewhere here. So that is, uh, you know, in the LV, mid LV is where we normally put it. After that it's a very straightforward case and just a matter of caution in this, the valve has to be loaded the yes, other way around. Yeah. <laughs> so otherwise everything is the same. Uh, the it also foreshortens from the. Yes. Yes. So, so the surgeons differ because Dr. Kim, we both were there. Yes. Why do you think the surgeons differ when they close? Sir, the closure is the challenge. The closure is a challenge because what happens is. So I'll, I'll, I'll show some videos that I have them. Close it first. Sir, some people put a patch on which one? So, I have which one? The problem is they are all frail. Transapagil is coming back to you, sir. And you are drained. Transapagil is coming back to you, sir. No, most of them are transapagil. They are working on transeptal.
We constantly disagree. So this is how they uh, locate the apex. So as we normally do for a femoral puncture, they put in a forcep and then locate the LV apex. I'll just play it again. Starting with So how do we put in a uh, uh, they push on the skin. You push on the skin, and then on fluoro you see where it is, and then you just have to locate the apex and then take the incision over there. Then it's a standard incision after that. Hurry up the apex. So. So we nicely so see the pericardium and the apex structure. right beneath it. So I lift the up the pericardium a little bit, it, open it up. That's how they reach the LV finally. Once surgical exposure has been achieved, the pericardium is retracted and stay sutures are inserted. So then, yes, yeah, and then after that, they just retract the pericardium laterally and so that the LV is seen well. Mm -hmm. And pacing they use on the effects only or put a pacing? No, we put in a pacing either. Because this you can't pace it. We can put on the effects. So just look at the effects. No, they said it's traumatic. You know, they said it's traumatic. You just put in an engine. So this is how massive pacing. Just play that again. <laughs> so this is how you poke a finger to see where exactly you want the puncture needle to be. And so you know, so you poke it just lateral to the apex so that it's coaxially. So this is seen on the T. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh yeah, they think that's the mitral, sorry. But they just uh, poke it lateral. So if you want to do a mitral, the flexor no, 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 no. is different so from where you want to do it. T is different. We should call Shiva. We should call Shiva. We can do it. Yeah. Uh, this is the first things how they take it. So they normally place some small pledges where they take the first string so that they know where it is. So Surgeons program. Surgeons program. So as this how much transepical is being done? Sir, actually in Europe uh, they are doing a lot of transepicals because in our center, the first choice is femoral, uske baad femoral with endotrectomy with surgeons, and then either supplement or fibrotomy. And it's a very quick procedure. In an hour and a half, the patient is in and out. So, the other advantage is that many surgeons are also independent. I'm just saying, they only are doing it. They only deploy it. So after the first string sutures are taken, this is how our standard uh, needle and puncture. Yeah, yes. And then through the wire, you cross with the wire to the iota. 
actually right in front of the and sheet. The now we have to lock loader. the loader onto the sheet and you heard the click maybe. So Next the thing is that we will introduce yeah. the, the valve, valve into the, the sheath and then while doing that we have to de-air the sheath and I'm doing that by pressing the two buttons. Is the this is well de-aired now.
Usually what we have had is we focused on one topic and then we have had either some cases but this was overlapping and then we had one short journal. So I will just quickly go through it but so motion try. So this was... So why we selected the topic is also people, the first question people ask is how much will this so fall last? Long term durability of TAVI has been the hot topic of 2023 and early 2024 and we have had three uh, large trials which have been published or presented in major meetings and the longest follow up we have to date in a large trial is the Nordic trial. So the other two trials, no shit, sorry, and the other two trials have been a partner three a partner evolute low risk and partner 3 which are 5 years and 4 years. So now we have a good amount of data on the durability of the TAVI valve across all plants. So that is why we decided to uh, discuss this article today. And this was presented in... Uh, next slide is it. This was presented in the European Society of Congress in Amsterdam last year. It has been published in the European Society of Cardiology. So, the Nordic Aortic Valve Intervention Trial or the Notion Trial was basically initiated in 2009 and completed enrollment in 2013. It was, the aim of the trial was to compare outcomes of TAVI and SAVR in all comer population above the age of 70 years. And this was predominantly done in three centers in the Nordic countries. The largest enrolling center was the Big Hospital at in Copenhagen. And the initial uh, trial was designed with a one year outcome but then they have continued the follow up and they are actually still continuing the follow up and their plan is to continue follow up till there are no patients remaining to follow up. So, <laughs> so I will come to that. Eventually everybody has to. <laughs> so, the first Nordic uh, Notion trial was presented in 2015 and uh, the five year outcomes were presented in 2018 and then the eight year trials of outcomes were presented and lastly the ten year outcomes were presented. So this uh, trial basically took all comer patients above the age of 70 years and they were randomized to either a TAVI or a SAVR. All patients who underwent a tower received a first generation or second generation self-expanding core valve and all patients who underwent SAVR received a tissue valve but the choice of the tissue valve was left to the surgeon. So the life expectancy had to be one year and the patient had to be suitable for a tower, self-expanding tower or SAVR. The, one of the drawbacks of this trial is that there were a lot of exclusions. So coronary art, concomitant coronary artery disease was excluded, other valve disease was excluded and patients with prior heart surgery or redo procedures were excluded. So all and bicuspid valves not, were excluded. Not all coronary artery, only severe ones. Yeah, which needs revascularization. So CABG plus AVR was not included in the surgical arm. So it was an investigator initiated non-blinded trial. This is the second drawback that the enrolling centers were not blinded. And the follow-up was done on a yearly basis and the plan is to continue follow-up lifelong. All patients were older than 70 years but the mean age of the population was 79 years and that is one of the uh, points which we will come to. All patients who underwent TAVI received a first or a second generation core valve and all patients who underwent surgery had a full sternotomy with either a porcine or a bovine valve but there was no annular enlargement techniques which were used. So this is another drawback of the trial that annulus was not enlarged. But then that's a real, like, a real world scenario, right? It is a, almost a real world. Uh, they have taken all patients who have come who meet the inclusion criteria. It was just, yeah. It was just by chance that it turned out that most of the patients were lower intermediate surgical risk. So the primary outcome was a composite of all cause death, stroke and MI after one year. One very good point of this uh, trial is that they have used very standardized definitions for defining the outcomes and they are a little complicated but I think it would uh, it is very useful even for us in day to day practice. So there are a few terms which they have defined. The first is what they called as a bioprosthetic valve failure. 
which is basically either a death which is related to the valve or a severe hemodynamic structural valve deterioration or anybody who needs a reintervention following valve degeneration. So this is what they call as a bioprosthetic valve failure. Now one component of this bioprosthetic valve failure is bioprosthetic valve deterioration or structural valve deterioration. So that is defined as a transprosthetic gradient of more than 20 millimeters of mercury or an increase of more than 10 millimeters with mean gradients within three months from the baseline. Or if there is a more than moderate intraprosthetic regurgitation, so not a paravascular regurgitation. And a severe structural valve degeneration is defined as a transprosthetic gradient of more than 30 or an increase of more than 20 millimeters and a new severe intraprosthetic regurgitation. So another term which was defined was non-structural valve deterioration which means that either it is a PVL or a PPM. Lastly was a bioprosthetic valve thrombosis and endocarditis although these events were very low. Also the follow up was only based on echo so they have not done a CT follow up. So pro subclinical thrombosis could not be evaluated. So halt and all no, that was not evaluated. So this is from the supplementary data and as we can see the baseline characteristic of the population were well matched but the mean age of the population was very high. It was a 79 year old was the mean age of the population and the STS risk score was intermediate to low so it was less than 4 for more than 80% of the patients. And the valves which were implanted were predominantly by a transfemoral axis they were all of the valves were core valves and the sizes of the valves have been mentioned so if you can see the surgical valves are predominantly from 19 to 25 because there was no annulus enlargement whereas the TAVI valves are predominantly 26 and 29 millimeters so this may be one of the reasons why they found that there was a discrepancy or why the results came out as they did these are the surgical bioprosthesis which were used Predominantly there were five valves which were used surgically, with the standard valves which have been used by most of the surgeons for decades on the So Chiral, that means Tavi was a larger in size when you yes. insert them? By definition, yeah, anyways, by even when so we that's see... that's not a discrepancy, right? That's, that's how But that is. is one of the explanations which has been given to explain why there were a higher effective orifice areas and lower gradient but normally if we analyze a CT and if we do a TAVI and a surgeon thinks of the SADR, our TAVI sizes are usually, usually larger. Than yes. So that means that this is very real world data what has been presented. And then again it's a supra annular wall we are talking about, not the intra annular wall where we have seen that the gradients could be slightly lower yeah. in triads but again not head on head. So coming to the results, so the primary outcome, uh, that study was designed to measure the primary outcome only up to one year, but this is the primary outcome at 10 years. So if we see all cause mortality, then the mortality is 60% at 10 years. So this is what we were discussing, so eventually everybody has to die. So they took 79 year old mean age of the population at the end of 10 years, 60% had died. Out of this, 50% of the mortality was cardiovascular mortality, only 10% of the mortality was non-cardiovascular mortality. So even if you do a tower in an elderly patient, he is more likely to die of a cardiovascular cause than a non-cardiovascular cause. So have they described which cardiovascular cause? No. So is it coronary artery disease? We don't. That has not been mentioned. Uh, so and when you combine all-cause mortality, stroke or MI, then that would the mortality was even higher, it was almost to the tune of 65%. So one of the things which was found in this trial was that the overall mortality was really high. But what they are also explaining is that because the mean age of the population was so high. So when the other two trials which have been published, which are the partner low risk and partner 3 and evolute low risk, the mean age of the population is younger, it is 73 and 72 years and in those patients in those studies, the mortality at 5 years is about 12 to 14 percent. But these were also low risk patients. These were low risk but older patients. Older patients. So, was less than 
and this is cardiovascular mortality we are talking about. This is all cause mortality, sir. But mortality. The yeah. what they have mentioned is that out of this 50% was cardiovascular mortality. So out of the 60, 50% was cardiovascular mortality. So when we come to the subgroup analysis of the mort all cause mortality was 62% in TAVR and 64, there was no significant difference. Cardiovascular death was almost 50%, stroke was higher in the SAVR group and uh, myocardial infarction and new onset atrial fibrillation was higher in the SAVR group. Pacemaker implantation, it's a core valve, older generation, so it was higher in the TAVR group. So this was as expected, but, then but the there was no difference between the mortality in surgery and time. But then the pacemaker rates, have you seen Are the 5 year data versus 10 year and it increased, the, it remained the same like this? That I have not analyzed that. It's a self expanding, no, because I not have self expanding. But I expect that at the end of 5 years, it would be difficult to attribute that, that to the TAVI virus. So we are degeneration as well. But, but I have not analyzed that. But this is significant. Otherwise, are you prominent placement? Because this is an older generation study. Because it's a 10 year old. But otherwise, on the, in the TAVI group, the pacemaker implantation rates seem pretty high. Right? So, so, what one of the comments made by Dr. Sondergaard was is that it was the initial days of TAVI with core valve. So, they have, feel that they have implanted a lot of pacemakers which now they would not implant. Also, now with the. implanted low at that time. It was still being Cusp overlap yeah. also was not, not there. there, so it is a very high rate of pacemaker implantation, but they feel that it would have been significantly lower if this was done in today's day. Also one of the uh, an subgroup analysis which was done was a echocardiographic follow up and this has been consistent across all the time periods, one year, five year, is that the TAVI group has always had higher effective orifice areas. Lesser. and lesser mean gradients and this is partly because the design of the valve and the larger size of the valve Quite whether it is very significant very and whether this translates to better outcomes they are we are not sure but the other trials with younger patients might show that TAVI may do better at 15 20 years because of this because the structural valve degeneration is correlated with the gradients at post procedure there is no subclinical data here. Now tell me one thing, no? just for my, I am ignorant about it, but bioprosthetic valves, like what we describe, this uh, subclinical point and all that that we see, that is because transcatheter aortic valves have been evaluated like that. Right. But is there any data no. like that no. on bioprosthetic valves? Not, not large, but bioprosthetic valves also have Sir, that I kind of phenomenon. In clinical experience, we have seen patients where I have seen we have to keep them on valves, otherwise even tissue valves, they develop Absolutely. problems. Yeah, yeah, bioprosthetic early degenerations we have you seen see. a lot, and the best valves also. Yeah, I might agree with this. So. And is also problem peculiar to balloon expandable valves more than self expandable valves. Now, one thing was the overall mortality of the population, but another very important question which needed to be answered was how well do these valves last? And I think this is the biggest take home message of this trial is that at 10 years, the structural valve degeneration was either better or equal to TAVI and SAVR. So if we see moderate structural valve degeneration, in the SAVR group, it was higher than in the TAVR group. And when we see severe structural valve degeneration, it was much higher in the SAVR group and a significant p-value as compared to the TAVR group. So that means they didn't die of uh, valve disease per se. They died of valve, we don't know. They died of valve disease. We don't what know whether it was a... Valve 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 it's not valve disease. It's a very, very less... I said, might is better. I <laughs> so what I want to say is if you are only 12 percent had mean gradient more than 20, they obviously didn't die of valve degeneration. They may have died of coronary artery disease yeah, or, or some other valvular artery disease. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. So valve in the back, then it works well. Works so that means the coronary access might also be an important role. It is possible. Is sir. It is possible. The thing is that they obviously did their power calculations. No? From a so from that perspective of just 140 and 130, so and then we talk about durability. Sir, it was powered only for one year. 
this is not power, power for 10 years. And then you are looking at ten year analysis. Ten years. That you are looking yes. at a 10 year analysis for a power for one year. It's a small That's also yeah. that is not true, a, so. like a very that good science. So it is true. if the Mumbai Tavi group decides that we make a registry and then follow up from here on, then yeah. it makes sense. Then, then it makes sense. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> what was also seen was that the paravalvular leak was higher in the TAVI group, but uh, that was also expected because it was an older generation device. Pacemakers and conduction abnormalities were higher in the TAVI group. The onset atrial fibrillation was higher in the SAVI group. The risk of structural valve degeneration and BVF was not different. What was also found was that PPM was significantly higher in the surgical group as compared to the TAVI group. And the limitations of the trial, I think we have almost discussed that it was the primary limitation is it was powered for one year, and whatever they are doing now is just extrapolating that. There was a significant attrition in the Sauer group in the follow up, and concomitant cardiac diseases like CF, cabbage, and bicuspid valves were excluded. They were older generation of heart valve systems. The they surgeons were did not have that. they were not enrolled in the trials. If you had a cabbage with AVR, you were not enrolled in the trial. There was no annular enlargement technique and another thing was in the surgical valves, it is now shown that the pericardial, bovine pericardium valves are better than the porcine valves and in this trial only 10% of the Saver patients received a bovine pericardium. So to conclude the 10 year follow up of the notion trial basically shows that the risk of Bioprosthetic degeneration at 10 years was lower with the core valve as compared with the Saver group, whereas the risk of valve failure, so mortality was the same and it also generalizes that for the first generation valves, we have now got a 10 year data that the valve is, if not better, equally durable to the tissue valves. Mortality doesn't correlate but everything else Saver was better. Mortality is very difficult to because it's a very old population, sir. Right. If you so, that, that's so, what, so, so you, you cannot fight nature. That is that's what yeah. it is. Right? It, that is. By the way, what was the PVL? You are likely to die. PVL, sir. If mild PVL was there in almost fifty percent of the patients, Again, cold and cold. moderate to severe PVL was in almost twenty five percent of the patients. Twenty five. Because you are first generation. Yeah. I think it was eighteen to twenty five percent. Moderate they to severe. Change and they'll keep changing. So you will never be able to. Excellent review. Excellent because you have what I would suggest is that you should write which is the journal article so that everybody has actually read about it and come. Usually we circulate the articles. This time we were a little lazy and And why I am saying excellent review because you really worked hard on it. I saw that you have even picked out the supplementary data. Samaj diya, aap janta ko nahi hai. Vartical ka supplementary data online ja ke dhunda hai. Oh, KM the MBBS. Thank you so much. Very good. Sir, next meeting. Next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will have dinner and uh, cocktails but then I think uh, the closing remarks will be